Bert, go ahead. Yeah, actually, these are my slides. What we mean by a balanced system is is that when you put your REC cluster together, if you use parts that are similar, in other words, similar sized servers, similar capacity switches, then you will build a balanced system and you won't have any Achilles heel or weakest link. But if you, for example, say, well, we're, only going, we're not going to do the NIC bonding for the private interconnect. We're just going to use a single NIC on each one. It wouldn't matter how big your servers are or how fast your switches or how fast your disks are, you would have built a weak link into what you've done. And likewise, if you bonded NICs on some machines, not on others, again, you would have a link, a weakest link in that. So you want to build an evenly proportioned system uh, so that you know that the behavior you're seeing isn't suffering because of one bottleneck or one particular shortcoming. Next slide, please. So the biggest question a lot of people ask is, should we do a few big nodes or a lot of smaller nodes? And a lot of times people are very comfortable with SM, S, SMP machines, symmetric multiprocessing, and so they tend to lead, lean towards a few larger nodes. But in reality, the whole concept of RAC is to build up this grid infrastructure, and so it's almost more intuitive or natural for this to, to think more smaller nodes. Next slide, please. But neither is particularly right. In other words, if you've got four mid-range servers and you want to press them into a rack environment, there would be no reason not to do that. Likewise, if you had 100, well, not 100, I guess, but 40 smaller servers and you want to put those together in a cluster, that would work as well. But again, you want to have uniform or even performance properties. And when you get something uneven in Oracle Rack, things break down. And I'll give you a very specific example of something you can run into. Now, this is not a hardware issue, but let's say you have a 10-node rack cluster, and one of your nodes has the wrong date and time on it. Let's say it's off by about 10 seconds. Now, that can happen, and that can cause a lot of problems in a rack cluster. So even an imbalance of something as simple as date and time can, can throw a monkey wrench into doing your rack. Next slide. Now, when you set up your rack environment, this is going to be new for a lot of people. In other words, when you've been doing single instance database, uh, you know that if someone calls you and says, hey, I can't connect to the database, you know, you look at the network, is it available? You look at the listener, is it available? Is the instance up? You, in other words, there are points of failure that you're very comfortable with. In a rack environment, there's an order of magnitude more failure points, and therefore an order of magnitude more things you have to look at when you're trying to figure out why a person might have a problem. For example, you might be using load balancing, and your load balancing technique could be off. All your traffic could be going to one node. You would have to know that that's something you have to check. And so what we recommend is when you set up your RAC cluster, you should test all these failure points. In other words, you should try having your application running, uh, and then dropping a node, or dropping the node apps, and, and seeing what happens and what the behavior is. Now, one aspect of that is it's good instructional training. In other words, for you to know what will happen so that you know how to troubleshoot. The other thing I find is a lot of times when you do the destructive testing, you can find some weak links that you weren't aware of. Maybe you didn't have quite the multi-path storage uh, set up that you thought you did, or maybe you have um, a storage switch that is over multipath and, and causes a performance problem under certain scenarios. So by doing this destructive testing, not only can you learn what to look for, but it also can help to unearth some additional problems. Next slide, please. And one additional note along those lines. A moment ago, Bert was talking about the difference between few large nodes versus uh, many small nodes, you can see that whole situation playing out with the Exadata offerings from Oracle right now. There are two big configurations that they're selling. One of those configurations has a small number of nodes that are relatively large. The other configuration has a large number of nodes, or that has more nodes, and they're a smaller configuration. Neither is better than the other. There are trade-offs in both situations. In particular, if you have a few large nodes, 
you tend to decrease the amount of interconnect traffic and your interconnect becomes less of a bottleneck. However, your, your availability situation is different because if one of your nodes goes offline, you lose a much larger percent of your total processing capacity. With a, a lot of small nodes, there's more interconnect traffic. However, if you lose one of your nodes, you're only losing a very small percentage of your processing capacity. So they're just different situations, and depending on what your goals are as you architect the system that you're building, you might go one way or another. Neither is necessarily right or wrong. And speaking of architecture, that would be one of your first phases as you look at deploying Rack. You need to think about how you're going to design it, what kind of hardware you're going to use. Um, there are a number of phases or there are a number of phases that you might go through depending on the goals that you have. A few are listed on this slide. You might do a proof of concept. You might do you might do stress testing. Uh, you might do here they mentioned QA or user acceptance testing. As mentioned, a test cluster, setting up your own cluster on your laptop. Cer certainly, it's important to think through your project phases, to think through your project life cycle, and all the different parts of the project that you want to include. This is, you know, probably most of you know this already, but it's it's always good to reiterate that you want to think. You have to think about the. Uh, the process of getting this out as well, not just about the technology and the bits and the bytes. You want to make sure that it gets done correctly. Real application testing is a good feature to mention since we're talking about testing. Real application testing is a, a new feature that has been introduced, well, I guess, no, that was an 11 GR1 feature, now that I think about it. Um, and it's possible to capture a workload in 10G and then replay that workload in, a, in an 11G database. Uh, the, I think that this is primarily geared toward testing for upgrades, but you could use it for a, a lot of different situations. It is a license option, it's, so you have to pay for it. Raw database load testing, simulating peak performance load, um, repetitive rehearsals uh, of your, your workload, what your application is doing. One more thing that's mentioned here. Oh, okay, and then now I see we're getting a recommendation. <laughs> I looked at the notes and I missed the heading. Best practices. So just for a moment, for a, just a few slides, I'm going to briefly touch on some some suggestions, some best practices for Rack. Uh, using ASM is something that Oracle has recommended. I've recommended it to a number of people. Not everybody uses ASM. There are some good reasons not to use it. Uh, at different places, but for the majority of cases, I think it's a good idea to use ASM. Services, I'm a big proponent of. Um, I've written a, a number of things about those. I, I do think that using services, whether you're on rack or not, uh, whether you are actively using services or not, I think using services and then using modules and actions to instrument your code is absolutely essential and should be part of your, your practices. The SP files on shared storage, automatic undo, automatic segment space, the ADDM, these are all good features to use. They're useful. Uh, it says on the top here to keep batch and OLTP processes separate. When that's possible, that's a great thing. Sometimes it's very difficult to do. Uh, we understand that. In fact, a number of these things, reducing commit sizes, reverse key indexes are great, no order sequences. These are great things if you can use them. And whenever you're architecting an application, you can use these features, it's good to do so. They will make a big difference, especially on Rack. But these aren't just for Rack. These things will also make an SMP application scale better as well. Um, automatic segment space management, really at this point, I, I don't see many reasons not to be using that. Uh, I think most, most systems that I've seen now are using ASSM, only uh, older systems that would still use free lists and free list groups which those two are related. The free list and free list groups are the alternative. Now, if you're not using ASSM, if you're using manual segment space management, I have actually seen a site once where they were doing that and they had not configured free list groups. And that's a no-brainer that you really need to make sure free list groups are set up if you're using manual segment space management. A note on NTP, 11GR2 uh, has a new feature uh, called cluster time services or something like that. You have to choose one or the other. Uh, NTP is a great way to keep time in sync across your cluster. Um, make sure not to use both that and the new Oracle time synchronization services. 
And the LMS process is, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Bert or Syed um, or Tariq, but I think the LMS is what actually serves the block across the interconnect, right? Yes, exactly. So you, yeah, so you, you don't want more LMS processes than you have CPUs. That could cause a big problem because those can be CPU <laughs> intensive and the cluster is very sensitive to those as well. And Jeremy, one other thing on that slide uh, that's pretty important. Uh, a lot of people have experience with Oracle and over the years have been using larger and larger and larger block sizes. Uh, anymore, you know, everyone will use an 8K right out of the box and 16 k <laughs> on the top. But keep in mind that if you're in a rack environment that you have to think about the, uh, the concurrency of needing blocks across nodes. And, uh, an example might be that you would find that a 4K block size might actually be more efficient than an 8K block size in a 10 node cluster in, say, an OLTP type environment where there's uh, a likelihood of high concurrency and specifically high concurrency for the block, not high concurrency for the row. So be careful when you use old and tried and true rules of, you know, bigger block sizes makes life better. That's not necessarily true in a rack environment. You have to pick wisely. Excellent, excellent point. Very similar to the NTP thing. It's always been a rule that you need to have NTP configured. And with 11GR2, just make sure that you don't use NTP and the cluster time services at the same time. Uh, but thank you, Bert. That's, listen to Bert. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. A last handful of recommendations here are um, being careful of your row, watching the number of rows per block. Um, it's good in general. As, it, as a DVA, it really is your job to understand a little bit about your application, if not a lot. Um, the, the job that nobody else can do for you, nobody from Oracle can do this, nobody from a support organization, they can't, they can't know your application. They can't know which tables are used a lot, which tables are hot, which tables are big, which tables have, are very concurrent, have many people accessing them at once, or are just accessed by one person at a time, which tables are accessed at night, which tables are accessed during the day. That might be different. Um, so it's, your, it's really your job to know a little bit and to begin to learn about the application, how the application uses your database. And that's sort of getting into this. That, that will guide your thinking about how, if a table is hot, you know, do you need to look at the number of records in a block? Do you need to make, consider smaller block sizes at your next upgrade? Do you need to consider messing with the init trans and the free lists settings on this table, depending on your segment space management again? 